What is up guys, Blue Spooky here. I've been doing the title question for about a week now, so I think I have a big enough sample size. It's fairly evenly split, with slightly more people saying they'd prefer the Mega Mix title, so we will be sticking with that for now. I did see some confusion. The Mega Mixes on the weekdays are all new stories, as well as I can keep track of at least. Please remember that I do read about 2,000 stories a year, so I'm not going to be able to keep track of all of them all the time. There will be some repeats every now and again, although I do my best to make sure that doesn't happen. There were also some people complaining about the amount of ads in recent videos. I don't really know what to tell you guys about that. I've not really changed the frequencies of my ads at all in the entire time I've been doing YouTube, so I'm not really sure what's going on there. With all that being said, if you guys end up enjoying this video, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. Doing any of those helps the video to do well, and the channel to do well, and ensures I can keep making these videos for a long time to come. If you guys have any thoughts about the stories in the video, please be sure to leave them in the comments below, as reading your guys' comments is one of my favorite parts about doing these videos, even if I don't respond to them often since I'm so busy. Last but not least, if you'd like to support the channel further than you already do, there should be a join button somewhere around the subscribe button. It's only $2 a month at the lowest tier, and you get special emoticons to use when you comment and a special symbol next to your name. No content is locked behind the paywall, it's simply something you can do if you'd like to support the channel further than you already do. Without further ado, thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll get right into the video. I'll provide a bit of background for everyone. I'm currently 29 and female, and this took place when I was 14 years old. I had just started 8th grade actually. I grew up in southeast Texas, and as I'm sure many of y'all know, fall is still pretty much part of hurricane season. It was a Friday night, and it was just me and my mother at home. My dad was out of town for work. I originally had some plans to go spend the night at a friend's house, but there was a tropical storm coming in, and my mom decided last minute that she would rather have me at home that night. I was pretty mad pissed of course, tropical storms weren't normally looked at too seriously. I honestly felt like she was overreacting. Of course, this was my I'm 14 and therefore a grown up mentality at work here. Still, my mom did feel bad, so we rented a bunch of movies and ordered a pizza, and got a bunch of ice cream for a great night in. My parents bedroom was on the opposite end of the house from mine. This part is important for later. We lived in a split-level house. The house I grew up in was built in 1950 and was a post-modern style. Think Frank Lloyd Wright. The entire back part of the house was all floor-to-ceiling windows. Think of it as just a huge wall of glass. The entire house was an open floor plan, so the kitchen was the first defined room with walls on the first floor. My bedroom was directly off the kitchen, while my parents' room was at the top of the stairs. She had gone to bed around 10 p.m. I went off to my room to watch two movies I had rented just for myself. The storm was really starting to kick into high gear. The wind was picking up, and it was raining sideways. I was in the middle of watching The New Guy, and I still remember looking at my clock. It said 12.53 a.m. I was getting pretty tired, and I could feel my eyes getting heavy. With the weather so bad, I remember thinking that maybe it wasn't so bad that I'd missed the sleepover that night. At some point, I must have dozed off though, because the next thing I remember was just hearing this huge crash. It was one of the big windows in either the dining room or living room. Our neighborhood was in a well-wooded area, and I thought that maybe a tree branch had fallen in the storm and broken the window. I left my room and went out to the kitchen. Right as I was approaching the doorway, from the kitchen to the dining room, I could see my mom coming down the stairs. At that very same moment, I saw a man standing in our dining room, covered in broken glass and blood. Due to where he was standing, I could not get to my mom. The man seemed to be young, early twenties, 
soaking wet and with no shoes on. I could see that he'd clearly just run through our window. He was bleeding all over, with glass sticking out of him at all parts, and was standing barefoot in the broken glass as well. It took him a second to register my mother and I. When he did, though, he immediately launched into this explanation of how he was being chased by someone who wanted to kill him, and we needed to call the cops right now. My still fairly innocent 14-year-old brain didn't doubt this at all, but my mom was eyeing him quite suspiciously. We moved into the kitchen. My mom grabbed her purse and my arm to keep me close. I had grabbed a kitchen towel to try and help his bleeding. My mom pulled out her cell phone and started calling our neighborhood patrol. I noticed this, and so on our landline, I called 911. We finished both of our calls, and now we were just waiting. The man couldn't seem to sit still and kept getting up and peeking through our kitchen windows, pacing back and forth. He didn't seem to notice he was cut up and bleeding everywhere. He was muttering under his breath. What happened next happened extremely fast and became a bit blurry. All of a sudden, the doorbell rang. I assumed it was our neighborhood patrol that my mom had called. The doorbell immediately sent the man into a panic. He jumped up and sprinted and grabbed a hold of me. He had me in a chokehold, and my mom was now screaming to let me go. He was looking around frantically, pulling me through the dining room and the living room, back towards our stairs. The doorbell began to ring again. My mom was still following close, begging him to let me go. He now had me at the bottom of the stairs, and my mom had a choice to go to the front door to open it, or to follow him up with me. She ran for the door, just as he pulled me up the last of the stairs. I could hear our alarms start blaring. Normally, we arm it at night, so you would need to type in the code before going out the door. He pulled me into my parents' room. As soon as we got inside, he dropped me and started to freak out. He was saying something about all the lights. He began to smash all the lamps and all the light bulbs as well, trying to get the lights to turn off. He was screaming that they were burning him. There was a small garden just off my parents' bedroom, and they had garden lights they turned on at night. He took up a chair and threw it at the glass door trying to smash it so he could get out and break those lights as well. At least, that's what it seemed like. I had crawled into a corner to get away from him at this point. When he completely turned away from me to grab another chair, I made a run for it. I sprinted down the stairs. And the cops had made it into the house at this point and were at the bottom of the stairs with their guns drawn. One of them swiftly grabbed my arm and pulled me out of the way once I reached the bottom. They took me outside to an ambulance and my mom. My adrenaline was coming down now. When it hit me, what just happened? I started shaking and could feel a pain around my throat from where he'd been holding me in the chokehold. There was a ton of yelling and screaming from inside. About ten minutes later, the cops came out with the guy in handcuffs. When he saw me, he tried to lunge at me, which was terrifying. I had a bruised windpipe but otherwise, I was relatively okay. I learned later that the guy was 20 years old and a chemistry major at one of the universities in town. Together with some friends who were also chem students, they had made their own PCP. Now, he had never tried PCP before, and he had a bad reaction. He had been driving to get some food when he'd started acting paranoid and upset. At the drive-thru, he insisted they let him out, and as soon as they did, he took off into the night. Apparently, thinking you're being chased is a common hallucination to have when you're on a bad trip of PCP. Light sensitivity is also a common side effect. He wasn't a bad kid. He'd never been in trouble before. He was a good student, pretty much the last person you'd think that would do something like this. Our house just happened to be the only one on our street that was not completely fenced off and that's how he was able to reach the back and those windows. When I got older, it really hit me just how easy it is to become just like that kid. I had friends who wound up being chemistry majors, and also DIY'd some of their own Thankfully, the night didn't end up worse, because it definitely could have gone in an entirely different direction. I've had a few delivery jobs that have given me the creeps over the years. One or two that I was pretty sure I was about to be robbed, 
another where a gunfight between gang members unfolded right in the street I was delivering to, right as I was turning onto it. But these are just occupational hazards. Yeah, it sucks, but you get over it. Only one job has ever truly terrified me, one that scares me to think about even today. So, we get an order from an address that none of us drivers had ever delivered to before. And this normally causes some suspicion among us, since we're always pretty wary whenever delivering to a new address. A fair few first-time deliveries end up resulting in an address getting blacklisted immediately. Sometimes they just try to stiff you for money, or scam to get a free pizza. Generally speaking, the drivers take turns delivering to a new address, and this time it just so happened to be my turn. So, once the order was completed and the pizzas were all boxed up, I took them out to the car and punched in the address to my sat-nav. It turns out the address was right at the very edge of our delivery area, pretty much right in the middle of absolute nowhere. It dawned on me that this could be the oldest trick in the book, call the pizza in some hard-to-reach location, then demand it to be free once it takes more than 45 minutes to deliver. To my relief though, I made it out to this old dirt road with plenty of time to spare. Yet my relief did not last long, at least not when I saw the state of the address I was supposed to be delivering to. The house was so run down, it looked like a squat, like it had been commandeered by the homeless as a place to avoid sleeping rough. There was a rusty old pickup in the driveway, its wheels askew from years of misuse. I mean, this place was the very definition of haunted house. Needless to say, I was not expecting a particularly generous tip. As I took the pizzas out from my passenger seat of the car, I started to hear this faint whining noise. My ears picked it up immediately, and I froze, trying to work out just what that sound was and where it could be coming from. I came to realize it was the sound of a violin being played. More accurately, the sound of a violin being played extremely badly. These discordant noises carried on as I walked up the dirt pathway toward the porch and the front door. The drag of some old violin bow across dry, old strings that were way out of tune was creepy, sure, but not what terrified me. When I knocked on the door, the screaming cat sound ceased instantly. A few moments of silence went by before I began to hear slow, heavy footsteps steadily growing closer. I can't be exactly certain, but I'm almost sure I could hear someone breathing on the other side, these heavy labored breaths as I waited for the door to open. And the silence was broken by a metallic snap of the door unlocking before hurried footfalls sounded on the other side. Someone had unlocked the door, then scampered away from it as if they were overly skittish about visitors. Uh, hello, I got your pizza order here. I remember calling out, feeling the tension rise once again as silence engulfed the scene. Come on, mister. A childish voice came from the other side. I wanted to turn tail and run at this point, but returning to the pizza place without the money for the pizzas would definitely mean a verbal or written warning from my manager. I already had one for turning up late, and I couldn't afford another. Reluctantly, I took hold of the door handle, turned it, and walked inside. The interior of the house was completely bathed in darkness. Only a handful of weak oil lamps gave me any sense of the layout. There was a figure crouched on a nearby sofa, the old violin lying next to it. There's $15 here on the table, mister. The person sounded like a child, but they looked much bigger. On the small, dusty coffee table, right in front of the couch, there was a pile of change. Normally, I'd have taken issue with this, but to be honest, I was desperate to get out of there at that point. I'd have taken any form of currency. As soon as I stooped down to start sliding the pile of coins into my cupped palm, I started to hear labored breathing again. I dared not look toward that person. I could see their legs in my peripheral vision. But even then, I could see how unnaturally long they were. This person was clearly not a child. S Sorry about the coins, mister. I saved them all up to afford this treat for myself. It's all I have. I told the person not to worry, in the sunniest disposition I could muster. The last thing I wanted to do was upset them. I pocketed the coins, barely having counted them at all. Hell, I'd come up with the difference myself if I needed to. 
I just wanted to get the hell out of there. As I turned to leave though, hastily thanking the person for their purchase, I caught a glimpse of their face in the low light of the oil lamps. They were burned, horribly burned all the way up their arms and chest. The scarred flesh extended all the way up to their face and head. The person's only visible features were obscured by a small rubber mask. The mask didn't even cover their entire face, only a small central portion that concealed their eyes, nose, and mouth. It had a long wooden nose, kind of like Pinocchio. The small carved eyes were blank. I averted my gaze away from the mask. It was one of the most hideously sad and scary things I'd ever laid eyes on. Just as I reached the front door, I heard that same childlike voice emanating from right behind me. Want to hear me play a song, mister? Before I even had the chance to answer, to tell them I was too busy, they grabbed the old violin next to them and began to whine out a tune. Although the strings were almost totally out of tune, I started to make out the tune they were trying to go for. You know the one. If you go down in the woods today, you're sure of a big surprise. If you go down in the woods today, you better go in disguise. I rushed back to the driver's seat of my car before you could even say, No, I'm out, scrambling to start the engine. I tried to make a quick getaway. I don't think the person had any intention of harming me. I certainly wasn't in as much danger as when those dumb sand crip blood wannabes decided to shoot it out right in front of my car. But something about that scene still creeps back into my mind when I lie there in the darkness, trying to go to sleep. Something that means I'll never ever make another delivery there. I'll quit before I have to go back. I don't believe in life after death. I also don't really see the point of graveyards myself. I personally think that once you die, you should be cremated, and that's that. However, even though these are my beliefs, I understand that cemeteries are important to other people, and thus they should be treated with the utmost of respect. When this happened to me, I didn't have a car. I walked to and from work. I didn't mind really, but I did have to walk through a cemetery in order to get to where I was going. It was a really huge cemetery as well, and would have taken me way too much time to simply walk around. Fortunately, it was completely open at night, and they had a paved path that led me all the way through it as well. One night, I was closing the restaurant I worked in, and I was going to be the last one to leave. We stayed open until 11 p.m., so it was nearly impossible to ever get out of the store by midnight. This night, it was considerably later even, so after I locked the store up, I immediately started to head home. As usual, I cut through the cemetery. I had done this so often by this point, there was nothing frightening about doing it at all, even in the middle of the night. About halfway through the cemetery though, something really odd caught my eye. I happened to notice a vehicle sitting somewhat down in one of the rows. It wasn't just resting on the path either, which was wide enough for a car to drive on. It was sitting directly across two graves. I thought this was pretty nice disgusting. It was nearly one in the morning, and the last thing I wanted was to trouble with anyone out there at night though, so I decided to go ahead and ignore it. When I got to the path right in front of the car, suddenly its headlights turned on. It immediately blinded me because they were the high beams. Of course, it was very dark outside as well. It was such a sudden brightness that it actually hurt me. I quit walking and covered my eyes. Before I even knew what was going on, the car had turned on, and they started driving directly toward me. The lights were shining right on me, so there was no way this person didn't see I was right in their way. Although I was still blinded by the lights, and I hadn't been able to recover my sight yet, I was able to jump out of the way just barely before the car hit me. They drove on by, then turned around between two of the gravestones and came back for me. It was just horrible. Not only was this person trying to hurt me, he was also haphazardly driving over and through other people's graves. He came back towards me, and I had to run out of the way again. The guy stopped now, fortunately. I was on foot so I was able to figure out a way to weave between the graves and get away from the man. I had to break my own ethical code and walk amongst them. I went off the path and ran, jumping over the gravestones as I went. 
I felt icky as all why I doing this, but the car was not a big car. It wouldn't have stood a chance trying to run over so many gravestones to get me. The person tried to follow me on the path for a while, though. It was extremely scary, because I wasn't sure what I was going to do when I arrived at the entrance. I was afraid that whoever this was would have me cornered once I reached it, and either run over me, or get out of the car to finish their goal to kill me. Fortunately for me, though, the luckiest thing to ever happen in my life happened. Across the entrance from the cemetery were two police cars with their lights flashing. They weren't there because of my ordeal, though. Apparently, they were just finishing a domestic situation across the street. The presence of the cars was just enough to cause the car following me to stop and begin reversing very quickly. One of the officers saw me running at the entrance and intercepted me. They had seen the strange car, but by the time I explained to them what had just happened, the guy had already sped off. I guess maybe it's not the most bone-chilling story, but it was definitely very unnerving to me. Someone driving across the bed of graves, trying to kill me as well, constantly with their high beams on blinding me in the darkness. I couldn't make out any of the details of the car because of this either. I was so upset by this that I went out, bought a bicycle, and rode around the graveyard every time in the future. When I was around 10 or so, my parents and I went to visit my grandmother for spring break. My cousin also came to visit as well, and we decided we wanted to go to the YMCA for the day. My grandmother dropped us off and said she would come and pick us up in four hours. On that day, the YMCA was empty. There were a couple of adults in the exercise room, but that's about it. We went to the basketball court, and after two hours of playing tag and shooting baskets, we were quite bored. I've never been the biggest fan of swimming, but this YMCA had a pretty cool pool area. We changed into our bathing suits and headed in there. The pool was completely empty, all except for the lifeguard. We played a bunch of games and swam some laps, but after an hour, there wasn't much left to do yet again. There was no one except us to hang out with to keep things interesting either. We decided to play a bit of a game, seeing how long we could hold our breath underwater. We stood in the shallow end near the clock on the wall so we could time ourselves. Instead of fully submerging, we'd just stick our heads face down in the water a bit. We did this a couple of times and I ended up winning. On our very last round, I felt a tap on my shoulder. I figured it was my cousin giving up and telling me I'd won. Instead, it was the lifeguard who told me to knock it off or she was going to have to ask us to leave the pool. Since we were tired of being in there anyway, we figured we'd just get out. We'd get dressed, go back to the basketball court until our grandmother picked us up and just wait there. We only had an hour left anyways and the water was freezing by this point. As we got out, the lifeguard stopped us and asked us if we wanted to go into the sauna to warm up and dry off. The sign said 18 years or older, so of course we were super excited she allowed us to even do that. She walked us to the sauna and unlocked the door. The door was glass and the interior was made entirely out of wood. Inside above the door, there was a clock, probably to make sure you were not in there for an unsafe amount of time. The lifeguard stand was adjacent to the sauna, but if you looked out the door you could very clearly see it. She followed us in, went over to the thermometer encased in plastic, and unlocked it so she could crank up the heat. I figured she must have to turn it on each time or something, so I didn't really think much of it. Both my cousin and I were very short girls, so we couldn't actually see the temperature that was printed on the thermometer knob. We knew she was turning up the heat at least. She left and shut the door behind her. I thought I saw her lock the door as well. I thought to myself, though, why would she lock the door when we might want to get out? I checked the clock and decided we should leave in about 10 minutes or so. It was already plenty warm in the sauna, but the room only began to get more blazing. It felt nice at first because I was so cold from the pool. After about 15 minutes, though, it was starting to get a bit too hot. My cousin agreed we should leave so we could get dressed. I went to turn the knob on the door, only to find that it would not budge at all. I thought maybe it had been jammed, so I shook it as hard as I could. It still wouldn't open. I then let my cousin try. 
she couldn't get it to open either. We figured the lifeguard would be back in a couple of minutes anyway, so we sat back down and waited. The room was getting hotter and hotter, and I really wanted to leave. We got up and started banging on the door for help, shaking and twisting the knob trying to get the guard's attention. As the room continued to get hotter, we began to scream at the top of our lungs for her to let us out, but she just stared straight ahead ignoring us. There's no way she wouldn't have noticed or heard us banging and kicking the door and screaming. By now, we had been in there for 25 minutes. It was so hot in the sauna I could barely even breathe. It felt like my lungs were on fire. My skin and eyes were burning. We sat back down and put our towels over our heads. They were at least still a little bit damp and made it easier to breathe. I was worried about my cousin especially. She was a couple of years younger than me, and she was really struggling. I looked at the clock and saw we had been stuck inside for 35 minutes. I got up and walked to the door again. I saw the guard still just staring straight ahead. Again, I tried to get her attention by screaming we needed out right now. I banged on the door as hard as I could, but still nothing. I was starting to get dizzy. I went to sit back down, but the wooden seats were so hot that they burned my skin. The towel was completely dry, so I put it underneath me to cover my skin. My hair was also extremely dry. I wrapped it across my face to cover my nose and squinted my eyes so they wouldn't burn as badly. I tried my best to still watch if anyone walked past the door. It helped me a bit. My cousin was laying down with the towel over her head, not moving or saying anything anymore. I nudged her to make sure she was still okay. I could tell we really needed to get out of here right now. She was extremely disoriented. It had been 45 minutes now, and I was beginning to get nauseous. There was no way the lifeguard had simply forgotten we were in there. I thought she would come back soon, but there was a little voice in my head telling me that she'd purposefully locked us in there. Finally, a man just happened to be walking past the door to the pool. I was too weak to even get up, though. My whole body was on fire. I was too dizzy to stand. Luckily, the man wasn't going to the pool. He wanted to be let into the sauna and came back with a lifeguard. I saw them walking this way and immediately jumped up to grab my cousin. I knew now for sure she had locked us in there because as she neared the door, she pulled out her keys to unlock it and let the man in. I didn't want to take any chances of us being trapped in there any longer. As the man was trying to walk in, I was desperately trying to shove our way out. As we were trying to escape, the lifeguard began to shut the door and try to push me back inside. The man was clearly confused about what was going on. Hey, what are you doing? I think they want to get out. The lifeguard let out a huge sigh and opened the door fully. I grabbed my cousin and ran as fast as I could to the changing room. We only had about 10 minutes before grandmother was supposed to pick us up. We were both so shaken by what just happened that we didn't say anything to each other as we got dressed or on the car ride home. When we got back to the house, my parents were making us dinner and I told them the story of what happened. They thought I must have been exaggerating and told me they didn't believe me. I truly believe that woman was going to let us cook alive in there. The only bit of doubt I have is what would have happened if we'd actually died. She obviously would have gotten the blame. So what was her endgame? I'm 21 now, but I still think about this interaction all the time. When I'm in small spaces or I get too warm, I still have panic attacks. No one I tell ever believes this story. I mean, I get it, it's pretty absurd, I know. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to ask for opinions or whatnot, but what do you think this could have been? Some crazy misunderstanding? Or do you think she really wanted us to die? If so, why? This happened about six years ago, but first, a little bit of backstory. Back then, I was in university and lived about 10 hours away from my parents. It was a long drive, and our hometown was super boring, so I only ever visited for Christmas. That year, though, because I was going through a bad breakup, I decided to go home for the summer, wanting to just be lazy and sunbathe in my parents' garden with some trashy novels. Luck had it that my cousin, who lived next door, who was two years younger than me and basically like my sister, was also home visiting her mom. My parents had a big dog that looked pretty scary but was a gentle giant and a surrogate mother to our kittens. 
Anyway, I was home for a couple of months, and my parents were going on a holiday for about two weeks to the other side of the country. I was okay being home alone, although it was a bit weird. At this point, I'd been living in a big city for a few years now, and I wasn't used to everything being so deadly quiet at night. All I could hear was crickets, and maybe sometimes a wild animal on the nearby mountains calling out into the night. and made it quite hard to sleep. I decided to move into my parents' bedroom. At least they had a TV in there, and I could keep it on at night for some background noise. One night, my cousin came to spend the night with me. Her mom was working the night shift, and she didn't want to be home alone. We decided to watch some horror movies and eat a pizza in bed. At some point, I fell asleep, but my cousin Anna could not get to sleep so easily. She was quite jumpy already and easily scared, so of course the movies got her really freaked out. I was deep in sleep when she woke me up super freaked out, saying someone was in the house. My mind was foggy, and I could barely keep my eyes open. I tried to tell her she was being paranoid and she should go back to sleep. She insisted there was someone in the house, and she was shaking and crying now. I started to really worry about her. I sat up and tried to shake myself awake when I began to hear a noise downstairs, as if someone had just closed some drawers in the kitchen. I flinched and put the TV on mute. I got up and slowly locked the bedroom door, then tiptoed back to bed to listen carefully. Now that I was more alert, I could hear the wooden floors creaking as if someone was walking around. At this point, I joined Anna in the freakout. My parents had a sensor light in the hallway. It was placed in the middle of the stairs, so it would go on if someone was walking around both upstairs or downstairs. I heard the click of the light going on, and I could see the light under the bedroom door. I was now 100% sure someone was in the house with us. I grabbed my phone to call the police, but the town was in the middle of nowhere, and I found I had no service. My cousin was bawling. I had to give her a pillow to put over her mouth to muffle the noise. She was holding down on it and even bit it to stop herself from screaming. Whoever was in the house was now climbing up the stairs. My mind was going a hundred miles an hour, and I was trying to think of all the possible scenarios. My best hope was that some neighbor had noticed my parents' car being gone for a few days. They know our dog is harmless, and they know my folks are doing quite well for themselves, so maybe they were trying to snatch some jewelry or something. I figured that if we kept quiet, they'd take whatever they wanted and then leave quickly. I told my cousin to quietly get under the bed. I looked out the window and saw nothing on the street. Since my parents' bedroom is next to mine, and mine has a balcony, I figured that if push came to shove, we could climb out the window, reach the balcony, and since it's overlooking the vegetable garden, we could jump and hop into the soft soil and hope we wouldn't break too many bones. As I moved to crawl under the bed as well, the doorknob began to rattle. Someone was trying to get in. I froze, and I swore time stopped in place. My heart was beating like crazy. I looked around, but the only weapon I could see was my mom's crochet needle in a basket by the bed. I grabbed it, figuring I was going to have to stab this sucker in the eye or something. The doorknob rattled for a few more seconds, then the intruder walked away. I could hear them shuffling through the rest of the rooms on the floor, but they were moving far too quickly to take anything. The worst thoughts crept into my head. My dad is a detective, and he's worked some horrible cases, some involving organized crime. What if someone was there for him? It wouldn't have been the first time our family was threatened. If that was the case, I might very well be dead by morning. This thought shot adrenaline through my body, and I couldn't hear anything for a few moments. I decided I had to get out of the room and find some way to contact the police. My cousin begged me to stay, but all I could think about was the worst case scenario. If they really wanted revenge on my father or something, they would burn the house down with us in it. As stupid as it may sound now, I was worried for my dog as well. She was out there all alone. If someone were to approach her, she'd probably lick their fingers right before they stabbed her or something. I took my phone and my crochet needle and bravely left the room. I stepped into my parents' dressing room and took my dad's baseball bat as well. 
Then I began to make my way down the stairs. The front door was wide open. As I walked outside, I could see a man running away into the night. I immediately called the police on the landline, and to my surprise, they told me a call had already been made for that address. They were on their way. I assumed my cousin had somehow called when I was gone, so I didn't question it. The police arrived in less than a minute. It was not my cousin who called. It took us a while to understand what was going on. The officer was just as confused as I was. In the end, what happened was this. My neighbors had not been made aware I was home for the summer. They knew my parents were gone and they saw the lights on in the house, so they began to worry. I didn't lock the door that night because I forgot and my dog had the habit of opening it with its paws and taking a nap on the sofa downstairs. It seemed she'd opened the door at some point in the evening and decided to go back. The door was left wide open. My neighbor thought someone was in the middle of doing something nefarious, so he went to the kitchen to grab a knife from the drawer and walked around to make sure nobody was in the house. He called the police, and when I got out of the bedroom, he heard me. He got scared and ran away. About two years ago, I used to work part-time at a popular pizza chain as a delivery driver. I had a full-time job during the day, so the shift at the pizza place would be from around 6pm to 12pm. I enjoyed the job for the simple fact that I made quite good money. It was fairly easy as well, but I hated working at night because it was really dangerous. One night, we got a call 30 minutes before closing for a delivery in the worst part of town. I was stuck taking the order, since my manager had sent the other driver home early. It was a really slow night that night. I hurriedly headed out to deliver that pizza. About 20 minutes later, my GPS said I'd arrived at the location. I couldn't read the house number though, as it was pitch dark. None of the houses had their porch lights on either. As a safety, I called the customer to ask if they could turn on the light to their home. They didn't answer until the sixth ring. He told me his house had two trash bins next to the curb, and the light was broken so he couldn't turn it on at the moment. I started walking through the front yard to the front door of the house I assumed it was, only to see a man staring at me through the window. I yelled out to him, but there was no reaction. He didn't even move to open the door. I started to get goosebumps, and I decided to turn around and go back to my car. I called the customer once more and told him to come out to my car to get his pizza. He told me in a slow, creepy voice to ignore his roommate. He said the door was unlocked and to take the pizza to the basement because he rented the bottom floor. As I was on the phone, I could make out a small light from the window. The man that was staring at me earlier was now on the phone talking to me. I assume he thought I couldn't see him. I hung up and took off right away. By the time I got back to the restaurant, phones were turned over. Any complaints would have to wait until the next day. I was not delivering to any basements, and I went home taking that pizza for dinner. This is one of my strangest stories. I'm not sure if it will scare anyone who hears it, but it was extraordinarily creepy when it happened. Growing up, I had a best friend named Bobby. We grew up in the same neighborhood, basically. We began playing together at such an early age that I can't even really remember when it was. We were friends before we even started kindergarten, though I do have some blurry memories of that first day. We always got put in the same classes as we advanced to the grades as well. He was easily my best friend, and we did everything together. We both started watching horror movies at a pretty young age, much younger than anyone should probably be watching them. But don't get me wrong, I'm not one of those people who blame their problems on scary media. And I also in no way feel that they eventually influenced his actions. But we watched all of the scary movies. I'd have to say that our personal favorites had to be the Freddy Krueger films. I wish they had YouTube back in the day. Maybe the sheer content of horror videos here might have changed the way things ended up. I say that because we burned through all the movies at the store several times. Bobby started looking for something else to satisfy his hunger for horror. 
and the thing he turned to was serial killers. He became completely obsessed with them. It was one thing to read about them in books or old newspaper articles, but Bobby took it to what I felt were very unhealthy levels. Around this time, there was a bit of a boom in serial killer entertainment in the world. At the comic book store that we went to, they began selling books that were supposedly depictions of serial killer crimes. If that wasn't bad enough, they even had serial killer trading cards. Now, Bobby really wanted me to share in his newest obsession. I tried for the sake of my friend, but it's one thing to watch horror movies where people aren't really being killed. It's quite another to read about supposedly depicted real-life murders, or to collect special cards that list real murderers on the back as if they're baseball statistics. I just couldn't do it. And that began the first separation that me and my best friend ever experienced. Bobby took his interest pretty far. When we'd hang out, we used to do silly things. We'd play pretend that one of us was Freddy Krueger and the other one was Jason Voorhees. But now he wanted to pretend to be Jeffrey Dahmer and tie me down to portray one of his victims. I don't recall the names of any of them and I really don't want to look it up, but Bobby knew all of them by heart. I just couldn't do that. The idea of doing it felt 100% wrong. Even writing it down feels wrong. Bobby was involved in the trading service at the time, which was advertised in his comic books. This was a few years before the prevalence of the internet. He used it to get these VHS copies of interviews with serial killers. I remember sitting through televised interviews with Ted Bundy and Bobby's personal favorite, Charles Manson. I guess he liked him particularly because he never really killed anyone himself. He influenced others to do his dirty work for him. For some reason, Bobby found that especially fascinating. He began to refer to Charles Manson as his idol. Most people, when he said that to them, just laughed because they thought he was being silly. I never laughed, though. I was the only one privy to all the information I'm telling you about, so I knew just how serious he really was. Now that doesn't mean I thought that Bobby would ever actually kill anyone. Our friendship sort of fell apart, though. The last time I spent the night at Bobby's house, we were both 14 at the time. The serial killer obsession had been going on for at least a year at that point. I was so sick of it. I brought over a Nightmare on Elm Street marathon collection I thought we could watch together. It had been a while since we'd seen them. Needless to say, Bobby was pretty annoyed with me, but I was pretty firm that this whole thing had been going on way too long. He relented and we began to watch the movies together. I wish I could say we had a good time, but we didn't talk at all during the movies. We just sat there, and Bobby kept giving me this weird stare. I could see him through the corner of my eye. I never looked over to acknowledge him, but I knew he could tell I was nervous and that I was trying my best to avoid looking at him. Movie after movie, he just sat there and stared at me the whole time. We watched the movies with the lights off as well. He was on the love seat and I was on the couch. When we got late into the night, I got tired. I laid down, and sometime during the course of one of the movies, I fell asleep. I'm not sure how long I had been asleep, but when I woke up once again, the TV was off, and it was pitch black in the room. I blinked a couple of times to get the sleep out of my eyes, and then I noticed a black figure sitting on the coffee table in front of me. I was startled. I began to move to get up, and when my eyes adjusted to the light, I saw that it was Bobby. He was wide awake, sitting on the coffee table two feet away from me, with his eyes bulging out of his head. He had a blank expression on his face, and there was no hint of emotion at all. I tried to ask him if something was wrong, but he wouldn't answer me. He just stared at me. I told him he was scaring me. He didn't respond still. It was then I noticed something in his hand. My heart jumped when I recognized it as his pocket knife. I jumped off the couch and asked him what was wrong. He just sat there and looked at where I had been sitting, staring blankly. That was too much for me. I had to get out of that house. I didn't even take the movies with me. I just told Bobby I was leaving. He didn't respond, and I guess I really didn't give him much a chance to. I had to get out. That was the last time Bobby was my best friend. We stopped talking altogether after. The two friends who'd begun kindergarten together did not begin high school together. I saw him in the hallway from time to time, but I never stopped to talk to him. 
He began hanging out with some burnouts. I recall them starting a band or something. He stopped going to high school when he was 16 and ran away from home. That was back in the early 1990s, and I've never seen him since. Now, I want to end this story by saying I don't believe that Bobby really became a serial killer or anything. I would be extremely surprised if he ever actually hurt anyone. There's no psychological evidence that collecting serial killer cards or reading true crime comic books can change the basic fundamentals of a man's psyche and cause him to commit murder. I don't think Bobby actually wanted to kill me that night either. He just got himself a bit obsessed with darkness and completely immersed himself in that life. It's not healthy, regardless of how you want to look at it. I hope he's okay, though, wherever he is, and I hope he was able to put all that darkness behind him. I had a really frightening experience with a friend of mine when I was way younger. I recall being around him a lot when he had an imaginary friend that he used to get teased about by the other boys. They saw having an imaginary friend as something only little girls did, or really, really young boys. So even though he was at a very young age, they teased him relentlessly about his imaginary friend and tried to force him to give it up. I stood by his side, though, because I liked him quite a lot. I never had an imaginary friend of my own, but I never held that against him. In fact, sometimes I wished I had enough imagination to have one at any time during my life. We liked a lot of the same toys and hobbies as each other, so we got along just fine. During the whole period of teasing, though, I do remember it getting to be a little bit too much for him, I suppose. It was then that he quit talking about his imaginary friend. Oh, I forgot to mention earlier that my friend's name was Brian, and his imaginary friend was named Billy. So, I think we were maybe seven years old, when Brian stopped talking about Billy altogether. After that, I just kind of stopped thinking about it. That is, until around the time we had just turned 11. I remember playing over at Brian's house that day, and he seemed to be quite upset about something. I guess because I was so young, it never crossed my mind to ask him what was wrong. I don't really recall exactly what we were doing, but I think we were playing his Nintendo, and he kept on dying pretty easily whenever it was his turn to play. That was extremely unusual for him. I didn't bring it up, though, because I didn't want to bother him further. Brian, on the other hand, asked me if I wanted to spend the night over at his place that night. This was something I was always up for, actually. I liked his house a lot more than mine, and my own parents would never allow anything like a sleepover, so I readily accepted. The initial evening actually went pretty well. I always enjoyed Brian's family, plus his video games were in his bedroom, so we could play them together as much as we wanted to. He seemed to be in a lot better mood now than he had been before. When bedtime rolled around, we started to get ready for bed. Brian had twin beds in his bedroom. I never quite understood why, though, unless it was for sleepovers. He never had another brother, and I know that none of his sisters slept in his room either. They both had their own rooms. While we were sitting there talking, I was surprised when Brian suddenly asked if I remembered Billy. Although I'd not thought about him in a long time, immediately I knew exactly what Brian was talking about. I knew he meant that imaginary friend and not anyone we actually knew by that name. I let him know I did remember, but I didn't say much more about him. Without any prompting from me, Brian suddenly told me this. He started visiting me again. I went quiet for a few moments before I muttered and, oh? Yeah, but he's not like how I remembered him. Before, he was really nice, and he played with me so much and was really cool. Brian was quiet for a few moments. I have to admit to being a little afraid of those moments of quiet, but I didn't let on that I was scared in order to support my friend. Now he just hangs out under my bed at night, Brian said, sending a chill down my spine. He keeps telling me he's going to grab me and pull me under when I fall asleep. I paused again before asking a question that frightened me the most. Under your bed or mine? Oh, mine, Brian responded. I thought I would have felt relieved that it was not mine he was talking about, but I didn't. I was even more terrified. 
Well, if you're worried, why don't we both sleep in the same bed then? I barely gotten the word out of my mouth before my friend jumped over to the bed I was in. It was just a twin, but we were small and scared, so it worked well. We didn't get a whole lot of sleep that night. We talked through our fear until we fell asleep together out of exhaustion. But here's the weird thing. He never mentioned Billy again after that night. It was like somehow me being with him that night exercised all the fear from him, and I never found out what it was all about in the end. When I was 17, my best friends and I were big fans of the show Jack's High. We liked to make up strange dares for each other to do. However, we really didn't do a lot of the painful stuff they did on that show. We usually were just much more likely to dare each other to do scary things or play stupid pranks on other people. A lot of the time, I was able to duck the more risky dares by not daring my friends to do anything too severe in turn. This strategy, of course, could not last forever, and soon my friends noticed I never really did anything scary as they did. So, they dared me to spend two hours by myself in the middle of the local graveyard in the middle of the night. I tried to shrug it off like it was no big deal, but in actuality, I had always been really freaked out by graveyards. I guess I didn't really believe that strongly in the supernatural, but even without that aspect, they were already creepy places to be in. I mean, just knowing that you were walking on the ground and dead bodies were buried everywhere underneath you, that should be enough to freak anybody out, really. Anyway, the dare was that I had to go into the graveyard at midnight, and stay there until 2 a.m. exactly. I had to go deep into the graveyard too. I couldn't take a flashlight, but I could have my cell phone on me, which would provide a little bit of light. My friends all waited at the gate, and I went pretty deep out into the cemetery. It was creepy and extremely quiet. All in all though, I thought I had it pretty easy. When I knew I was way out of my friend's sights, I found a place to sit down. I stared at my watch and realized I was just 10 minutes into the dare. I sat down and tried to keep myself company. After a while, I began to hear some sounds that weren't too uncommon. It sounded as if animals were scurrying around on the leaves. Occasionally, I would hear the sound of a twig breaking or something. It was very unnerving, but it was not anything I couldn't explain. After a while, however... I suddenly heard an extremely loud snap off in the distance. I jumped up to my feet just from the sheer surprise. When I did, I looked over in that direction, only to see the outline of a man standing a bit away from me right by a gravestone. It was impossible in this lighting to tell if he was looking my direction or not, but I knew that if I could see him, it was completely conceivable he could also see me. I didn't get too worried though. Actually, my first thought was that this was likely one of my friends trying to scare me. They probably figured there was nothing to really be scared of in a graveyard, circled around me, thinking they'd give me something to be scared of instead. Ah, oh, come on guys, this is so lame. I called out to the man. I wasn't sure which one of my friends it was, as there were six of us all together. Oh, I'm so scared. The figure of the man began to move towards me. They didn't move too fast either. This, in my mind, confirmed it must be one of my friends. If it really was someone to worry about, someone who wanted to do me harm, would they have been walking so slowly and confidently towards me? I called out to the man a couple of more times as he slowly walked over. I called out the names of each one of my buddies, expecting I'd eventually correctly guess which one it was. There was no answer each time so I finally remembered I had my cell phone with me. The light was not very bright, but I thought it might be just good enough to let me make out who this was. So, I shined my light on the man. Immediately, I realized this was not one of my friends. I couldn't make out his features exactly, but from what I could see, this was not anyone I knew, or anyone I ever would know. But that wasn't the worst part. 
I caught the light of my cell phone glinting off something he was carrying in his hands. I knew it had to be a knife. I can't explain the feeling fully, but it felt like I was hit with a sudden electric shock. I didn't wait around though. I turned back in the direction I'd come from into the cemetery and ran like hell. It didn't take long before I could see my friends off in the distance, and I was calling to them to run. They didn't though. They all just looked around very confused. I was panting by the time I reached them, but when I looked back, the man was nowhere to be seen. I tried to explain to my buddies what happened, but no one believed me. They all thought I'd just chickened out on the dare and called me a wuss. Some of them even thought I was trying to turn the dare back on them. You know what though, I don't even really care. I'd rather be a living wuss than a dead brave guy. I work as a pizza jockey, aka a delivery boy, in my spare time. The other day, an order was made. We live in a pretty small town, which only really has a McDonald's and a Pizza Hut. Considering the Pizza Hut is located at the shopping center, which is basically smack dab in the middle of town, we delivered pretty much everywhere within the town's limits, and if we had the time, we'd go out to the local farms as well. Now, I would always handle the in-town deliveries, but I worked later than the pizza jockey who handled the farms, so sometimes I would have to deliver to those farms very late at night. There was recently a local ad for an outside room for hire at one of the farms, which also happened to be my friend's farm. Shortly after, someone hired the room, and we got a delivery from that place. To no one's surprise, I was the one who had to deliver. When I got there, it was completely quiet, eerily so. I texted my friend to see what was going on. I asked them where they were, only for them to tell me they had all gone into town to visit the local swimming pool. The only people that were supposed to be on that farm were me and the people who'd hired the outside room. I go over to the door. I knock. No answer. I call out to whoever might be there. Hey, your pizza's here. Still no answer. In the very next instant, all I could see was pure white. Someone had been hiding behind the wall, and they sprayed talcum powder, of all things, directly into my eyes. I stumbled backward and tried to rub my eyes clean. In the process, I dropped the pizza. The man grabbed it and rushed into his car, a red Toyota. I was extremely confused and disoriented. I decided I needed to get into my car and drive away as fast as possible. I had no idea what was going to happen if I stayed there. As my engine started up, I could hear his do so as well. The man started to follow me. My eyes were still sore and blurry. I rushed my way to the police station. As soon as he saw I was en route to the police, he took a sharp turn in another direction. The next day, I told my boss about what happened, and he kind of freaked out at me for losing a pizza. Then he said he was glad I was okay. I called my friend, telling him that guy was crazy and soon the poster for the outside room was up again. The pizza thief had been kicked out. Yeah, he really thought he would get away with that. My eyes were still itching even a couple of days later. The guy was soon under arrest in the police station for a couple of weeks, after which he moved out of town shortly after. I was a pizza delivery driver for eight months here in Midtown Detroit. It felt like years. I've had some real crappy jobs since I dropped out of college, but being a delivery driver was by far the worst thing I've ever had to do for money. It goes way beyond just being talked to like a moron by some heavy-set Armenian shop owner or being screwed of a tip by some white trash bimbo who lies about the lateness of her order. I've been robbed, beaten up, and almost killed on the job. The first time was when I was delivering to an apartment building over near 8 Mile. I had just gotten out of my car and was grabbing the pies from the back seat when I saw a group of teenagers rapidly approaching. They started to make jokes about how beat up my old Taurus was, and I suppose I'd be lying if I said they had no grounds to do so. That thing was a godly rust box. 
They were talking trash, and I was given as good as I got. Seemed like it was just a bit of fun. That's when I feel one of their hands reach into my pockets, trying to grab the folded stack of dollar bills I use for change. I was pissed, but when I turned, one of the kids had pulled this huge knife out, telling me to hand over the cash. I just kind of reacted. I threw the only thing I had available to me right at that little knife holder. I didn't expect this, but as I threw the pizza box, the whole thing just sort of fell apart in midair, freeing the hot pie to land right in the kid's face. I always knew our shop had a reputation for delivering piping hot. I guess that's why it was so busy. But with the way that kid started screaming when the molten cheese stuck to his thieving face, wow, it was ear splitting. I saw that same kid a few days later, had bandages all over the side of his face the pizza landed on. I'd be lying if I said that didn't make me smile. It wasn't even the robberies that were the worst though, because a few years back, something started happening to pizza delivery drivers here in Midtown that's almost straight out of a horror film. A big part of gang initiations around here is taking a potential member out to jump someone, but since they were doing this in public, the cops got wise pretty quickly. After trios of scumbag crip or blood clones were getting locked up on the daily, the gangsters decided to smarten up a little. I knows whose idea it was, but some way, somehow, someone must have gotten the idea to ambush delivery drivers after luring them to abandoned spots throughout the city. The first I heard of this was a guy from another shop getting called to a quiet, mostly derelict neighborhood on the edge of town. He'd arrived at this big red brick house, walked up to the front steps. Apparently, there was a handwritten sign on the door that read something like, Doorbell's broken. Come around back. There's a tip in it for you. Tip must have been the magic word that did the trick. Pizza box in hand, the guy walked into the backyard of this big old house where he saw some kid pistol in hand. No one knows what exactly went down, but it ended with the delivery driver being shot in the head and neck before the assailant stole nothing more than $20 in change and single bills. His funeral was a month ago now. A few of the drivers at my shop stopped by to pay their respects. I didn't though because I felt like I'd be imposing. Besides, I never mention it to anyone but I didn't really like that guy. No one deserves to lose their life over a god-made delivery job, though. But this was right in the middle of this whole gang initiation thing happening. Who would drive out to an abandoned neighborhood after getting an order of any topping any soda? After that, the shop I was delivering for started to blacklist neighborhoods that were forbidden to deliver to after dark. Even that didn't keep us entirely safe, though. A buddy of mine at the same shop managed to get himself jacked in the middle of the day, delivering to a fancy residential neighborhood. Some gang members had busted into a house whose owners were on vacation. He rang the doorbell, they pulled him inside and proceeded to rob him of the maximum $20 in change. When he told them truthfully that was all he had on him, they beat him half to death before stealing his car. He was in the hospital for a week while his jaw was wired shut. That leads me to my last delivery that I ever drove for Armin the Armenian's pizza place. The fancy townhouse beating my buddy had suffered left me quite paranoid. Because of this, I borrowed a 44 revolver, thinking that maybe I should just go ahead and quit sometime soon. It was surreal in the extreme, being given the rundown on how to load and fire the thing and where to best shoot someone. It was like I was enlisting in the army or something. I had to remind myself this was only a pizza delivery job. So I rock up to the address I'd been given, two pizzas in the back seat, when I notice it's suspiciously quiet. There's a public park on the other side of the street, and thanks to a row of bushes, I couldn't see anything from approaching that angle. I started to get a bad feeling, a really bad feeling. I took the 44 out of my glove box. That's when I saw a man emerge from the bushes on the other side of the street, wearing one of those god made clown masks. That's right. When all those attention-starved assholes were putting on clown masks and scaring people for the sake of getting a perfect viral video. But I wasn't taking any chances. I tapped on the glass with the revolver in hand, looking over at the guy and pointing the gun plainly in view. He stopped, took one look at his revolver, and reached behind his back into the waistband. I remember cracking the window and shouting, Don't do it if you don't want to get shot. I'm not a particularly brave guy. 
but I don't know. The thought of ending up with a wired jaw, and the thought of that poor kid who went out to work one night and never came home. I was ready to kill that son of a bitch in the clown mask. He just wasn't a real person to me. It was like a living embodiment of everything I hated about living in this city. I kept the gun pointed at him as I drove away, the two pizzas still in the back seat. I quit the moment I arrived back at the shop. Armin didn't even act surprised when I handed him back my uniform and collected the money I was owed for that shift. It's been a while since I quit, but I still think about it most days. It's in the news all the time. Some driver getting robbed or beat or worse. Everyone seems terrified of automation right now, but it can't come soon enough for some jobs. Jobs that just aren't worth losing your life over. This happened to me when I was a pre-teenager. I would say tween, but I kind of hate that word. I was still very interested in things like scouting and camping, and getting all muddied up with my friends. I hadn't quite gotten to girls yet, but that was coming along pretty soon. At the time, I loved any kind of camping, and although this wasn't an official scouting get-together, I wanted to do a camp out in my parents' backyard. Now, I wouldn't say we lived out in the country per se, because we really didn't that much, but we did have an enormous backyard. What? Even with all the different places I've lived since then, I'm still in awe of just how big that yard was. It was great for playing with the dogs, playing baseball with my buddies, it was just great for a lot of stuff altogether. So, this was midsummer when we were beginning to get somewhat bored of all the time off from school. The days were quite long and monotonous, so I asked my parents if we could have a camp out in the backyard. All of us were scouts, and we had done this before, so my parents had no problem with it. Now, one thing we liked to do was let everyone have their own tent. I sort of preferred sleeping alone in mine anyway. This is pretty important to the story. We did all of the usual camping things. We made a small fire in the little stoned-off area my family used to make fires, and we made s'mores as well. Actually, that's kind of what made me decide to tell this story, seeing someone buying the very same things to make them in the store today. Eventually, after talking about all the things 12-year-old boys find important, we decided to go to bed. I didn't know what time it was, I read a little bit by my flashlight before finally going to sleep. I fell asleep pretty easily, too. The fire had been quite small, and we'd put it out before going into our tents for the night, so there wasn't any more light to keep me awake. I wasn't so sure what woke me up at the time, although nowadays I think it was the sound of the zipper on my tent being lowered. My head was extremely foggy, and I couldn't see much of anything either. As I started to clear up, though, I noticed that there was a figure at the entryway to my tent. I immediately guessed that it was either one of the other boys, or perhaps my dad had come outside for some reason. Immediately, I grabbed my flashlight and flashed it over at them to see who this was. I was good enough with controlling the light to shine it just under their head, so the light wouldn't completely blind them in the darkness. It took me less than a second of observing to realize that the man who was coming into my tent was absolutely not my dad, and way too old to be any of my scoutmates either. He was up to that point the scariest looking person I'd ever seen in my life. He had this long hair, and the most insane eyes I'd ever seen. The look on his face I can only describe as completely crazed. The man was on his hands and knees, and started to crawl toward me. He put one of his fingers to his lips, as if to indicate to me to not talk or make any noise. For a moment, I didn't. It had nothing to do with his advice, though, and everything to do with being afraid. He began to crawl further toward me, and that was all it took. I began yelling and screaming bloody murder like you couldn't possibly imagine. I faced the other wall of the tent and did everything I could to get out of there. But of course, I wasn't going to get out of there. I didn't see any lights in the house go on either. Fortunately, my scoutmates were near enough to wake up right away. I began to scream to them, There's someone in my tent! There's someone here! Now, I didn't know exactly what happened right away in the chaos and darkness, 
I could see light through the tent, but it was too opaque for me to make out exactly what was going on outside. It seemed like one of my friends went running to the house to get my parents. What I quickly became aware of, though, were the other kids who quickly rushed to my rescue. They all began to attack the man simultaneously, who was trying to get into my tent and had actually grabbed hold of my foot. He quickly let go when the kids began to attack him. I couldn't tell if they pulled him out of the tent or he'd simply tried to force himself out of there despite what they were doing, but the thing I was happy about was the fact that he had let me go. The very next thing I heard was a gunshot ringing through the night. There was a lot of commotion and even some yelling from the other boys. I still couldn't come out of the tent though. I laid there in fear until my older brother came in to get me. He rushed me and the other boys back to the house while my dad held the man on the ground with his rifle pointed at him. The police came quickly and arrested the man. He was found guilty of attempted kidnapping before being extradited to another state where he was put on trial for the kidnapping. I don't know what happened to him, but if he died in prison, I don't think I would mind too much. I didn't ever go camping again after. I just couldn't stand to be in another tent after that. I took a gap year before I started university, and I would highly recommend one to all those who have doubts over higher education or are second-guessing their choice of course. Getting a job and suffering the daily grind was something that really helped me to grow as an individual. In other words, working for minimum wage sucks sad, and I had absolutely no intention of getting stuck in a dead-end job like that. The whole experience made me hungry for the chance to earn a better place in society. But what can you expect as a pizza delivery driver? I know for a fact it's one of the most soul-destroying jobs a person can have. Filled with all kinds of employment pitfalls like paying for your own gas, getting your wages docked for late delivery, and getting treated like a criminal by your taskmaster turned manager. Honestly, I can't complain too much though. My dad helped me out with the finance on a cheap secondhand car. He even gave me a hand in getting the old rusty thing back in working order. I may or may not have picked delivery driver to put him in that position in the first place, but that's a story for another time. So, the owner who'd given me the job in the first place was a top bloke, a Kurdish fella who'd escaped Saddam's Iraq in the early 90s. He'd come here with no more than a hundred quid to his name, but by the time I came to work for him, he was definitely worth more than a million. Most of his money would have been tied up in various takeaway businesses, but the spanking new white BMW he drove around said it all. The guy stayed pretty humble, though. He always greeted you warmly, remembered your name, asked after your family. Like I said, a top bloke. The English guy he'd hired as a manager, though, was not so nice. In fact, I'd go so far as to say he was a complete wanker. Good at his job, don't get me wrong. The place ran like clockwork but the man had next to no social skills and really rubbed the staff the wrong way a lot of times. Like this one time, when he found out that one of the delivery drivers had been losing pizzas, he did investigating and found out he was losing them to the same address over and over again. He'd come up with a different story every time, drop the box, some teenagers stole it, turned out he'd just been dropping them off at his friend's house. He got the sack, but it was us, the drivers, that remained that really bore the brunt of it. He instituted a policy whereby anyone who failed to deliver their order would have the same amount docked from their wages, not the cost of the business, but the full sale amount, considerably more than the sum of any pizza's parts. We were pissed off, but I don't know really. So, this is how I almost ended up breaking into someone's house one night trying to deliver their pizza. I drive out to the delivery address in my beat up old Valhall, listening to the newly fitted engine purring like a dream. It was one of my last deliveries of the night, with the cutoff time being 11 p.m. I had that kind of second wind excitement that comes with knowing you're off work soon. Still singing along with the radio in my car, I pulled up outside this big old Victorian three-story. I grabbed the thermal bag from off the passenger seat, then strolled up to the front door. And this was about the time of night that tips get pretty big, too. People can be very happy to receive hot food at this hour, especially when they've been partaking in a certain variety of 
tobacco, if you catch my drift. Anyway, I whistle away to myself, banging on the front door of this old house. Banging, knocking, banging again. About a minute goes by, and it dawned on me that no one was answering. Must have been some sort of mistake, I think to myself. I head back to the car to check the delivery notes to make sure I've gotten the right address. This is where the problem arises. I couldn't really tell if the person who'd written it down had put down a 1 or a 7. I decided it had to be a 1. The thing about the UK is we don't really get those crazy long house numbers like people in the States do. So, with me being 90% sure this was the right house, but being 100% worried I was about to have 20 quid docked from my already meager wage, I set about trying to deliver this bastard pizza. I legged it to the front door, hammered on it once more just in case, then decided to take things a step further. I started shouting, Hello? Anyone there? through the rectangular brass letterbox. The only thing I could hear in response, though, was the meowing of cats. Like a boatload of cats. I got this absolutely horrendous whiff of something truly disgusting. I suppose the cats meant a lot of full litter boxes. Gross, but true. I went to the living room window, just a few feet away from the front door. There was a little crack in the curtain, where I could just barely peek through to see if anyone was home. You'd be surprised at the amount of people that call for a pizza when they're not even there, thinking they'll be fast enough to get home before it arrives. When I peered through, though, I saw something that I can still see when I close my eyes sometimes. The room was dimly lit, only the flickering gray of TV static illuminating the interior. It took me a few moments to realize what I was actually looking at. I could see one couch was absolutely teeming with felines. I mean, every square inch was covered in cats. Just a veritable legion of little furballs surrounding it, trying to leap up and join their feasting friends. Yeah, that's right, feasting, for on that very couch lay the dead body of their former owner. Her cats had barely even waited till her body was cold before they scrambled all over it. I could see them plucking out her eyes and chewing her lips off. They were tearing away at the soft parts. Anywhere not covered with clothing was a mess of blood and torn flesh. Her own cats were eating her right in front of me. I called the police when I got back to the shop actually giving the prick manager the finger when he tried to interrupt me giving a full account to the dispatcher. They thanked me for informing them, and I actually read about the whole thing on a local news site the following morning. The dickhead manager tried to dock my wages for the non-delivery. When he told me that, I just quit there and then. Big twist, the Kurdish owner called me up the next day. He called to ask if I was okay after witnessing that horrifying thing, and more importantly, to offer me my job back. He'd hashed it out with the manager himself over unfairly trying to dock me. He supported the policy to an extent, but never in a case such as this. I took the job back, but I did have a favor to ask him. I'd be looking for a better job, but I needed a good reference. I was 18 and had never been employed before. Getting those was a nightmare. He promised to give me a glowing one. I actually ended up getting an interview for a law firm to work as a legal apprentice. Low pay, but not no pay. This is pretty much exactly what I needed to secure myself a place on a law course at Newcastle University. In the end, I guess the guy talked me up to be some sort of prodigy. I got into my uni, and I graduate next year. Oh, and just my luck. What I'd thought surely was a 1 did turn out to be a 7 in the end. What an unfortunate thing I stumbled upon. It was late spring of my seventh year in school. It was a rough school in a sketchy area. It was my third year of middle school. I was in a program to better integrate classes. The enrollment for the program was fairly small, even smaller numbers for women, so making female friends in this isolated environment was difficult at best. That's when I met Sabrina. She wanted to have me and her friend Kylie spend the night, and I was absolutely thrilled. She lived in an apartment with her mother and brother that was across from a racetrack and a bar. Super sketchy area. Her mother apparently sold handmade keychains at the flea market each weekend. Things started to get weird about the time we ordered pizza and a movie. Her mother was a little bit odd and hung out the whole time like she was a 13-year-old girl. 
regularly going into her room and calling Sabrina back with her. We couldn't ask what was up because her mom was always there. This was the age of pagers. Finally, around 9 p.m., her mom went to bed. To our dismay, though, ten minutes later, she called Sabrina to come to bed with her. Apparently, she was going to stay with her mom at her own day sleepover. So, left with a couple of pillows that had seen better days, and no blankets or bedding at all. Kylie and I were going to have to have a sleepover by ourselves. We started the movie back up and tried to make the best of it when Sabrina came out to get the phone. As she was about to go back into the room, she whispered to us, Don't stay up too late now. We have to go to the flea market tomorrow and leave at 5.30. I guess she saw our faces. She did this creepy little laugh and said, You didn't think the pizza was free, did you? She then rushed into the room and locked the door behind her. Kylie, who I'd just met this evening, and I exchanged glances. This was the first we were hearing about this. We were never even asked. After a short conversation, we both decided we wanted to go home. Our parents were more likely to be awake now than early the next morning. We went to knock on the bedroom door to tell them we wanted to go home, only to be met with no answer. We tried again, but nothing. There was no way they were asleep that fast. I went to the kitchen to see if there was another phone. Nope. They'd locked us in the living room of this one-bedroom apartment with no phone and no restroom, and now they refused to respond to us at all. This is where the young and dumb us formulated a plan. We knew the school was not too far away. Kylie said she lived nearby, so we decided to find a payphone and walk to her house together. I mean, how bad could it be? Biggest mistake of our lives. We tried knocking one last time, only to be met with the same result. We gathered up our belongings and made a plan to leave. We snuck out through a window. How the world changed outside after 10 p.m. The bar, a stone's throw from the apartment, was absolutely jumping. We went up to the payphone that was near the street and close by the rear of the bar. Great. Just to our luck, it was broken. As I put the receiver down, this drunk, burly man rounded the corner towards us. We were two 13-year-olds, but we could have passed for 17 easy. Neither of us were dressed showing much skin, but the drunk dude apparently really liked what he saw. First, he yelled and asked if we wanted to party, or if he could buy us some drinks. No thanks, we replied, and started to walk in the direction of her home. This seemed to infuriate the man. He was now yelling that we were skanks, and nobody ever turned their back to him. We tried to keep moving on, only for him to stumble after us surprisingly quickly. He caught Kylie by the wrist. She was trying to shake him off, but he was much too strong. He started telling us what he was going to do to us. We were terrified, because she couldn't break his hold, and he refused to let go. And that's when I landed a shot right to his family jewels. We took off running but that must have sobered him up quite some bit because he got even angrier in his pursuit. We scanned the area, but there was no place to hide, no place to get help either, and we were now not trusting if we saw someone that might help us. The area had quite a few ladies of the night and other sketchy people. We ran back to loop around the apartment Sabrina lived in, but somehow one of Mr. Drunk's friends had joined his pursuit. We know he was behind us, he was alternating between telling us what he was going to do to us and yelling to his friend, saying there was one for each of them and to not let us get away. Now we were trapped. We booked it, much to my chagrin, up the metal stairs and onto the second floor. We started pounding on doors, but in that area, nobody was going to open their door past dark. Luckily, we found an open door at the very end. We were in the clear, or so we thought. I could hear the clink-clank of one of them coming up. The stairs had no second-floor visibility, luckily. We dashed into the room, only to see it was a laundry room with no door to lock. We started wedging ourselves between the machines, praying and hoping we would not be found. The man was on the second floor and heading our way. Everything went quiet, except the distant voices and music from the bar. He didn't leave, I think. I didn't hear him going down the stairs at least. That's when the aroma of alcohol and smoke descended upon the air. 
He was in the doorway, listening for us. I know you're in there, girls. There's nowhere for you to go now. If you come out, I'll forgive the bitch that kicked my nuts, and I'll go easy on you both. So come on out. After a moment, he spoke again, and his mood flipped once more. Okay, you f***ing I'm gonna yank you out by your hair, and you get the idea. Rough like I like it. I'd love to say someone overheard all this and intervened, but of course, they did not. After what seemed like an eternity, he stood there for about 20 minutes before we heard him descend the stairs. We hid for another 15 before checking to see if it was safe to leave. Long story short, we made it to Kylie's house, which was not as close by as she'd said. Still though, we had our lives. My father came to get me after midnight. The next morning, Sabrina's mother called and feigned cluelessness as to why we would leave. She claimed we'd never knocked and lied about snatching the phone. She thought it was normal to make her daughter's friends work for free. Sabrina and I didn't speak much after, needless to say, and Kylie's parents believed all of Sabrina's mother's nonsense and grounded her for an entire month. This all happened such a long time ago, but it still stays with me and haunts me to this day. I'm sure there are moments in your life that when you think back on them later on, you tend to wish you had been able to do something different in that moment. This is one of the things that bugs me the most. A few Halloweens back, I was trying to find something new and scary to do. I know, it seems a little cliche, but I thought I would explore a graveyard. I myself am definitely a believer in the supernatural and thought that if there was any place I would be likely to see a ghost, it would surely be in the middle of a graveyard. I even brought a camera and other supplies with me, since I thought I would stay out there for a long time. I got my flashlight and set out to exploring. The ambiance was extremely creepy. I had never been in the graveyard at all, let alone during the night. For the first maybe 45 minutes or so, I jumped at every single sound and saw all sorts of weird and freaky shadows and shapes out of the corner of my eye. After about an hour though, the creep factor began to swiftly wear off, and although I was still quite interested, I was not creeped out anymore. I guess I had been silly, thinking that I really would see a ghost so soon. When I didn't, I was very disappointed. After a while though, I heard a loud noise, then I heard a lot of rustling, when I looked off in that direction and shined my light, I saw a dirty old man sprinting right at me through the darkness. Scared, I tried to warn him that I was armed. I was not, but it quickly became apparent that he was not trying to hurt me. Help me! Help me, please! The man called out as he caught up to me. He was very nasty looking and smelled nasty as well. I figured he was a homeless person who was living in the cemetery. I wanted to get away from him at first, and informed him I didn't have any money. I don't need money. Someone is trying to kill me. Please, help me. Honestly, I didn't believe the man at first. I just wanted him to get away from me. But still, I couldn't just leave him there. I asked him who it was that was trying to kill him. He was unable to give me any specifics. He said he hadn't even seen who was after him. He just knew that someone was trying to kill him. By that point in time, I had been around the entire graveyard, though. I knew there wasn't anyone in it but me and him. I didn't know what this man wanted, but I was positive there was no one trying to kill him. I shone my flashlight around just to appease him and let him know I could not see anyone there but us. I told him I had to be on my way and started to walk away. He would have none of it though. The man began to follow me, just raving on and on like a lunatic. I was convinced by this point that he was either a paranoid schizophrenic or having some sort of mental breakdown. I tried to get away from him, but he grabbed onto my arm and roughly tried to pull me back. I'd had enough by this point. I hauled off, knocking the guy down to his butt. I told him I didn't know what his game was, but he was going to stay the hell away from me, or he would have a big problem. While he was sitting on the ground, still carrying on, I turned and ran, making my way swiftly out of the graveyard. The following day, I was driving to work when I noticed something. 
something that scares the hell out of me to this very day. I'd seen many funeral processions driving into the graveyard in order to bury a dead body, but this was the first time I had ever seen an ambulance outside a cemetery and they were loading a gurney into it as well. A gurney with a closed up body bag in it. It was the first time I'd ever seen a dead body being taken out of a cemetery. Now obviously, I didn't see the body itself, but there weren't really many options of who it could have been. Either the homeless guy really was telling me the truth, and someone did kill him that night, or I was right about the homeless guy being a dangerous lunatic and he'd killed someone else who happened upon the graveyard that night as well. Either way, either prospect is way too scary for me. I've never walked through that graveyard, let alone at night ever again. The first thing you should know is that I was blessed slash cursed with young looking genes. Everyone always thinks I'm way younger than I actually am. This bizarre event happened a few months after I turned 18. Bear in mind I looked no older than 16. I lived in a very large, diverse city. I'm Latina and grew up going to a church that belonged to a larger organization. Because of this, this particular church had a lot of locations, internationally, and about five within this city alone. I went to this church ever since I was born, so I knew most of the congregation. There were very few people I didn't know, but there was one man, let's call him Nate, that always made me feel uneasy and sick. The church had a routine of creating a line after service ends, so we can all greet each other and talk for a bit. I hated having to greet him, though. I told my mom how I had a bad feeling about him, and she would just tell me it was all in my head. Fast forward to a few months later, I was sitting in the dining area with my friend's boyfriend. We were just chatting, joking, and waiting around for her. Nate was sitting about two tables away from us. There was no one there but us three. He just sat there, staring at us. I briefly mentioned to my friend's boyfriend how Nate made me feel so uneasy. I was irritated because I could feel him boring holes into me with his eyes. I rushed over to the restroom to get away. When I came back, I saw Nate was now sitting across from my friend's boyfriend talking. It was a little bit odd, but as I approached, so did a group of our friends. Now it was eight of us, ranging from the ages of 16 to 22, sitting with this man in his late 40s. With everyone now having arrived, he sat in complete silence with us, just staring at me every now and then. About five minutes later, my friend's boyfriend told him we had to leave, so we all got up and left Nate there sitting alone. When we got to the meeting place in another part of the building, my friend's boyfriend pulled her and myself apart and talked to me. Hey, look, maybe I'm biased because what you told me earlier, but when you left to use the restroom, he rushed right over and started asking all these things about you, even asked if I was your boyfriend. He looked a little bit mad. The crazy part is, at that moment, my friend told us that when Nate first started coming to our church, he'd messaged her on Facebook. He kept on sending her messages that he was so lonely and wanted to be friends. Coincidentally, that's when she started dating her boyfriend, so she changed her relationship status and the messages stopped. At that time, I was taking a social media hiatus because my ex couldn't handle our breakup so well. He was harassing me everywhere. After my friend told me about the messages, I decided to log in to my own Facebook, only to see there were thousands of unread messages from him. He didn't actually use his real name on this account, which should have been a red flag immediately. The messages all started nice enough. Things about being friends, they would eventually get verbally aggressive because he thought I was ignoring him, or whenever he saw me talking to any of my guy friends at church. I made the mistake of immediately blocking him and deleting the message thread. Always keep the evidence. I brought it up to my parents and they again blew me off. Said it was a cultural thing because Nate was from El Salvador. Apparently it's common to be overly affectionate with strangers in most Latin American countries. A few days later though, my parents did a complete 180. When Nate first started coming to church, he sat all the way in the front row and I, being a teenager, sat all the way in the back row with my friends. Slowly, over the last few months though, 
Nate had begun to start sitting one bench further back, until finally he was sitting on the same bench as my friends and I. I don't know about y'all, but in my church, women have to wear skirts or dresses during the service. For Saturdays, there are morning and afternoon services, and in between they have many services and workshops for different age groups and genders. This particular Saturday, I wore a knee-length dress and had a couple of friends sit between Nate and I. I was whispering with my friends during the afternoon service. Normally, when it ends, everyone kind of hangs out and socializes. During this time period, my dad was working the night shift at a hospital, so he would have to leave before the afternoon service ended. My mom would still like to socialize afterwards, though. This Saturday, though, my mom immediately herded our family to the car ASAP. My friend, who had received the messages as well, was sleeping over, and my dad had asked us to buy a couple of pizzas and meet him in the cafeteria of the hospital. We all ate, talked and joked around, until my dad asked my grandmother to take my younger brothers outside to play giant chess just outside the cafeteria. Once they left, my dad apologized for never believing me. I was of course completely surprised because I had no idea what he was talking about or why they'd both had such a sudden change of heart. He went on to tell me that my mom had happened to look back during service and saw Nate hiding and watching me during the AM service at church. She'd asked my dad to speak to him during the break. My dad never wanted to go into much detail about what was said, except but to tell me the following. Hey, my wife and I have some concern over your interest in our daughter. Let me stop you right there. Your daughter and I are in a beautiful, committed relationship. It's God's will for us to be together, so you shouldn't try to stop God's will. Man, what's wrong with you? She's just a kid. If you were really looking for an actual relationship, you would be pursuing one of those older single women in this church. You're f***ing sick. Hearing my dad confirm what I suspected all along and validating my gut feeling made me break down in tears. The whole situation frightened me because I knew he wasn't just trying to sit on my bench. He was working his way to me, to sit next to me, to talk to me, and worse, to try and touch me. My dad proceeded to tell me he'd talk with a group of pastors at our church about what Nate had been doing. One of the pastors had yelled out, Are you seriously going to let him do this again? Turns out I wasn't the first. My friend wasn't either. There had been someone else before. I didn't know who, but I was set on finding out more. I called around and let people know from the other churches in our organization to keep an eye out for this man just in case he tried something inappropriate with any other minors. My investigations paid off, and I found three other girls, 13, 15, and 16, all from different churches. They all had the same story. He tried social media contact, and eventually went to in-person contact. The 13-year-old had an older sister, who fortunately knew what to do in such a situation, and handled him. A few weeks later, he moved to another church, the 16-year-old went to a church that was pretty much made up literally of her entire extended family. Almost everyone there was related. Apparently, a couple of her older cousins caught him trying to force himself on her at church of all places. It's unclear if they threatened violence or actually beat the shit out of him. I do know the police were involved only because of the cousins, not because of what was happening with this minor. That brings me to the 15-year-old girl. He did this whole routine with her but it actually got to the point where he managed to get her number and was texting and calling her at all hours. Her brother stepped in and asked him to stop. Turns out, Nate was being prepared to be a pastor at my church, and even though my dad complained about his behavior, they were still going to go ahead with it. I told my dad after I stopped crying that I wanted to talk to a lawyer ASAP. My dad happened to have a friend that was an immigration lawyer, and she offered to help connect us with someone that could help us. The lawyer said because he never actually threatened me or tried to physically harm me yet, we didn't have grounds for a restraining order. I don't know if it's like that in all states or just in Texas. My dad informed the pastors prior to our meeting with the lawyer that we were going to seek legal counsel to see what my options were for dealing with Nate. This unfortunately led to a spread of false information, because by next Saturday, everyone who wasn't directly informed by my family believed I was trying to sue the church. These were mostly people that knew me my whole life, people I loved, 
They called me a gold digger, said it was my fault for dressing provocatively, and that I'd probably led him on. Keep in mind, my dresses were all at least knee length, never wore v-necks, and if my shoulders were exposed, I always wore a cardigan. It broke my heart, especially when one of my uncles actually sided with them. To this day, I only politely greet him. I don't hate him, but I don't really care about him anymore either. The decision to not have my back affected his relationship with everyone in our family, including his own kids. It took a few weeks, and eventually I stopped going to church. Nate stopped showing up at that same time as well. He stopped trying to message me from his fake accounts as well. He just disappeared altogether. Things got so hostile that the president of the church organization administration had to step in and hold a hearing for everyone's complaints. It was decided it would be best if my dad stopped attending church because he was a troublemaker, even though all he was doing was standing up for me. It was announced a week later that my dad would no longer be welcomed. My dad took a few moments to say goodbye in front of everyone and said we'd talked as a family and not a single one of us would be coming back. He was choosing to leave, remembering all the good life lessons he'd learned in his 20 years of attending. He asked them to truly learn from God and their mistakes and to be better in the future. Everyone started crying, including all those people who'd initially called us gold diggers and even called me a slut to my face. I even remember this one older lady that was BFFs with my grandma, saying she and her husband really loved me, but I had stopped loving them. Nope, it's the fact you called me a slut even though you were one of the people who would change my diaper back then. It made me so angry. It still makes me angry thinking about how it all escalated. I also get mad at the system and myself, because I know Nate is still out there. Even though he lost interest in me when I challenged him, it doesn't change the fact that I couldn't stop him, and he'll always continue to target underage girls. Sometimes I can't help but worry, because I know eventually talking and looking won't be enough for him. I just wish I could have done more. What is up guys, Blue Spooky here. Thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it this far to the end of the video. If you liked the video, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. If you have any feedback for me as well, be sure to leave that in comments below the video. If you guys have a story you'd like to send in, or if you'd like to contact me for any reasons, there will be links to my social media in the description below the video including my Facebook, Gmail, and Twitter accounts. Go ahead and send me a message on any of those, and I'll try to get to you as soon as possible. If you do decide to send in a story, please be sure to include in the tagline what the name of the story is if it has one, what type of story it is if it has one, and how you'd like to be credited in the description below the video. Please make sure to include as much detail as you feel comfortable with and try to use as much proper grammar as possible to make sure you have the highest chance of appearing in a future video. Overall, I think that's pretty much it for now, guys, so thank you so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a great day.